Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on looking back to look forward, environmental chemical exposure and breast cancer. I'm Dr. Michael Mislack, Associate Chair of Pathology at Newton Wellesley Hospital in Newton, Mass, and also the Medical Advisor to the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. Thank you all for joining us today. The Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition is dedicated to preventing environmental causes of breast cancer through community education, research advocacy, and changes to public policy. I'm delighted to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Maricel Maffini. Dr. Maffini is an independent consultant with more than 25 years of research experience in the field of carcinogenesis and breast cancer, in particular reproductive biology and endocrine disruption. For the past 10 years, her work has focused on safety and regulation of chemicals and food and the decision-making process behind them. Before becoming a consultant, she was a senior scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council, a senior science officer at the Pew Charitable Trust, and a research assistant professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Matheny, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mass Breast Cancer Coalition for inviting me again to be part of this webinar series. It's always a delight to be with all of you. And I have, uh, I hold Massachusetts in a very special place in my, in my heart after being living there for many years. So uh, briefly, I want to um, discuss with you today where we have been um, in the last few years with regards to uh, breast uh, breast cancer, chemical exposures, and breast health, and where uh, we can learn from those experiences and where we are we are going in the future. So very quickly here, this is my disclosure. I do consulting with public interest organizations, with uh, companies, and uh, the, the opinions uh, in this presentation are my own. So briefly, as I said, we will review, uh, do an, an incomplete recap of breast cancer and environment history, uh, looking at some of environmental chemicals and their association with cancer, um, and how we are now thinking about reframing the discussion, the discussion um, beyond uh, cancer and um, what we can do next to protect uh, breast health. So this is something that, uh, just a reminder that um, breast cancer in females are still a big problem. We have uh, numerous, uh, two, over 200,000, almost 300,000 of cases of uh, female breast cancer estimated to happen in, in the year that is ending. And uh, of those, almost 3,000 are male cases. My talk is mostly related to female um, breast cancer, female breast, but I don't want to forget that this is also a disease of, of um, our partners, the males. And in, in Massachusetts specifically, the estimated cancer, uh, breast cancer for females are a little under 7,000 for, for the year that is finishing now. So it's still prevalent, it's still with all of us, and um, we need to continue working to make it less prevalent. So this is a, a, a recap of three specific events that I thought uh, are worth mentioning on the relationship between breast cancer and environmental exposures. The first one is the 2003 uh, development or creation of the Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Program, um, usually called BCERC. That was an effort that, um, that was the result of a partnership between the advocacy community and the scientific community with the sponsorship by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And the goal was to work in multidisciplinary systems where uh, different partners, communities, doctors, uh, surgeons, uh, scientists would work to try to understand the effect of environmental exposures 
um, a predisposition to development of breast cancer. So these were uh, all studies done in the human population. The second one is what happened in 2010, where for the first time, um, a government um, sponsored report brought light to the issue of cancer in relationship to the environment. And this was the President's Cancer Panel Report from 2010, where they actually identified the environmentally induced cancers and the underestimation of the burden that that is on the, um, on the rise of the disease. Um, and they specifically were trying to figure out what can be done um, to move that issue forward. And the last one is something that is very new, um, although it has been brewing for a couple of years, but it's a new initiative, also a partnership between the scientific community, the advocacy community, um, trying to figure out how to reframe the conversation about breast, breast health, breast cancer, uh, using a multi-pronged approach to, approach to affect change. So the BSERC, as I said, it was a multidisciplinary network across the country. There were centers specifically dedicated to study human um, exposures. Um, they were focusing on windows of susceptibility uh, across um, the life of a woman, uh, gene environment interactions, the effect of diet. Um, there were, uh, as a, as a as a result of this, there are hundreds and hundreds of publications in the public domain, and uh, they were focused on uh, mostly on uh, when it comes to chemicals, to hormone replacement therapy, and when it comes to environmental chemicals, endocrine disruptors, so the chemicals that can interfere with the normal function of hormones, and how would that increase the risk of um, developing breast cancer. The second one, briefly here, is the uh, some few statements that were made in the President's uh, Cancer Panel Annual Report from 2010, where they acknowledge uh, the large amount of chemicals that are in the marketplace, um, and that number actually was only related to industrial chemicals regulated by the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, and not doesn't really cover all the chemicals that we have in the diet that are added to food or come into contact with food. So uh, many of them are under, they acknowledge they're understudied, under-regulated, exposures are not controlled. Some of them are carcin non-carcinogens, some other suspected carcinogens. Uh, there are, um, there's an acknowledgement that children are more vulnerable and more susceptible to exposures to different um, aggressors like chemicals or radiations, and that we are constantly exposed to uh, a number of chemicals and mixtures of chemicals through um, our air, food, water, and uh, there is a there is a, a, a strong need and an urgent need to have some kind of control over those exposures. So when it comes to chemicals that are uh, known to cause breast cancer, the International Agency on Research on Cancer, there are uh, identified only very few that are known human carcinogens. As you can see, not all of them are chemicals. Uh, some of them are uh, radiation. Uh, some are habits that we have, drinking alcohol, and others are therapeutics. They're hormones. And there are also a handful of suspected carcinogens. And the difference is that there is some evidence, but it's not conclusive. We cannot really connect all the dots between exposures to dieldrin that, that is a, 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 an herbicide, or ethylene oxide, or PCBs, the polychlorinated bisphenols that are, uh, have been mostly phased out from commerce and uses but they are still in, in some specific uses and they, are, they accumulate in the body. They last for many, many years in the body. And, uh, and also uh, dioxin, there's another 
bioaccumulative chemical. So this, this, as you can see, there are uh, not many um, known or sus suspected uh, chemicals that could be uh, considered um, uh, the cause of breast cancer. The problem with the human breast cancer studies is that there are many challenges, including the fact that it's, ex it's very hard to reconstruct exposures that occur um, many, many, many years before we notice that there is a problem, that there is a diagnosis of breast cancer. Also, uh, it, as the list uh, showed, uh, we are looking at individual chemicals or individual pharmaceuticals, and we are actually exposed to many different chemicals at a time. We are looking at a cocktail or, or mixtures of, of chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Um, some of the other problems also to really close the gap into whether or not a chemical could be causing something, uh, a particular disease like breast cancer in this case, is that some chemicals are uh, metabolized very quickly, so we cannot really catch them sometimes, quote unquote, in the body. On the other hand, we also have the problem that we also are exposed to chemicals that persist persist in the environment, so we are constantly exposed to them or accumulate in our bodies, which means that we don't know how much, what is the, bird, the burden, how many, how much of those chemicals we have in our bodies and how often they are, you know, being um, circulating and touching all the different organs and how that uh, hazard effect is affecting uh, organs such as the breast. But, uh, on, on the other hand, we are also seeing other issues related to breast um, complications and our um, chemicals that are associated uh, with um, either uh, working exposures like firefighter foams and these polyfluorinated alkyl substances called PFAS uh, that uh, are affecting um, the the way the breast works, um, PFAS are also uh, used in, in food packaging, in your popcorn bags or pizza boxes and, and the like. Um, they Once they get in the body, they last there for many years. So what we are seeing now is that these exposures to fluorinated chemicals actually shorten the nursing duration in women. Um, we are also seeing a trend towards early onset of uh, bra uh, breast development. And, and both of these things are considered um, uh, in, that increases the risk of developing breast cancer later in life. So is, there are, we are seeing more and more problems with how our breasts work. Um, so based on all this, there is a renewed effort and a renewed focus on the mammary gland as an organ that should be better studied when it comes to exposure to chemicals. And it's also a, a, an attempt to reframe the discussion that is um, a, a little bit beyond uh, just breast cancer. So there is a group that has been working uh, as a multidisciplinary group uh, and um, in two different continents that have been working for a few years now, trying to figure out where we go with um, when it comes to breast health. And they have put together um, a group that has been working on something that they call Breast Matters. And they have come to um, the conclusion that there are um, human studies that show really worrisome trends uh, toward early breast development, uh, difficulty breastfeeding and nursing, increases raised, uh, rates of breast cancer in young women. That is the population that was not, um, for many years, wasn't uh, being looked at uh, in, in, in close, um, very closely. Um, there are plenty of animal studies that actually show a link between 
all these outcomes and chemical exposures. And in particular, those chemicals are usually related or called endocrine disrupting chemicals because they interfere with the normal develop uh, the normal function of hormones that are fundamental for the breast uh, function. So uh, the conclusion of this, uh, one of the conclusions is that basically we are not uh, testing um, chemical effects on the breast as best as we could. So the current chemical testing approaches to measure the effects of chemicals are often missing. They are not even looking at the organ itself during the testing of chemicals or when they do, the, the assessment is usually inadequate. So this, this new uh, partnership, the Breast Matters, um, there was a workshop that happened in um, November last month. It was uh, spearheaded by a Silent Spring Institute, also in, in Massachusetts, scientists from uh, the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, um, environmental justice uh, advocates, environmental human and health advocates, and there were people like me and other NGOs that are uh, focused on regulatory and policy advocacy, uh, trying to figure out ways that uh, we can work together and, and um, reinforce the efforts uh, that each of these groups are um, making. Um, with the with the overall goal of putting the breast health back in the forefront of a discussion. Um, so there are two issues that I want to mention that are um, dear to my heart and um, that are part of this uh, overarching effort. One is the mammary gland in chemical testing and what we are doing or not doing and what we can do better. And, and second, how, to, how we can reduce chemical exposures. So the developmental exposures to chemicals is something that is not frequently assessed. Um, neither EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency or the Food and Drug Administration have a, a recommendation or a demand for information on how chemicals affect the development of organs, specifically in this case, the mammary gland. So we know, um, and many of you may know already, there are specific windows in the development of the breast where the risk to, uh, uh, to have an adverse effect due to radiation exposures or chemical exposures is increased. And I'm mostly going to look at fetal exposures and puberty exposures. But as we all know, the breast is, is a very unique organ that undergoes so, so many changes through our lifetimes. And we all know every month uh, the breast goes through, uh, through some um, uh, very specific changes. Um, and this is a very crude schematic of how a mouse mammary gland is developed, but it is similar to what happens in, in humans. I just like the, these pictures because they're really telling. So the mammary gland develops in the womb and starts from a little bud on the, on the skin that is over here. Um, and then this, this little plaque here, it grows, it goes underneath the skin and it starts producing these buds. And then the buds continue to branch and produce the ducts. So this is when a mouse is born over here on where it says A. This is the little tree that uh, it's, uh, a new, it, you can see in a newborn female mouse. This is what happens during puberty. Here in B, there's a profound transformation and growth of uh, the ducts, the tiny little branches that were here, they become this very long, very uh, branched uh, kind of tree 
with this leading edge here, this is the look like matches, um, the head of a match. Uh, those are leading the efforts to profoundly invade all the tissue underneath uh, these ducts and make the mammary gland whole. That is how it looks like here in C. And in D is what happens. This is how the mammary gland looks like when it's lactating. So all this, this uh, hollow ducts here that will conduct the milk then become loaded with all this. It looks like a tree in the springtime. Um, with all these uh, these clusters that are uh, uh, producing uh, milk that then is transported through these ducts. So that's very briefly what happens in mice. It's not that different in in humans, but what I want to show you is how sensitive the fetal mammary gland is to chemical exposures. And these are experiments that were conducted at Taft University. And these are mammary glands, these two pink little trees, A and B. Those are um, from a, a, a mouse that was two days before it was supposed to be born. And the top is an animal that didn't have any exposure. The mom was not given any BPA, bisphenol A, that we know is an estrogen. And the one in the bottom, number uh, letter B, that was a mouse that was born to a mother that was given bisphenol A. Just with a naked eye, you see the differences. Now, the, this, this duct here, they need to get hollowed so they can actually carry the milk. And this is what happens here in E. You see it, there's a hole in, in this solid cord of cells. Now, when the animal was exposed to BPA, that, that hollow, it doesn't appear. This continues to be just dense and completely um, a hold, uh, not hold, field um, duct. So what happens during development actually persists over time and is manifested in different ways. Here on the left, you see a, an adult mouse that didn't have um, any uh, babies yet. Um, on, the, on the left is one that was born from a mom without BPA, and the one on the right is from an animal that was exposed during development to BPA through the mom. So as you can see, again, with a naked eye, they look quite different. Uh, these were young adult animals. This over here in pink, you can see that there are that, these little round things that we call beads. But what happened here, this is a year old mouse that was again born to a mother exposed to BPA, where those ducts that were hollow, all the cells start to grow into, into the duct and they form all these bridges that you can see here in this one, uh, in the red cells, all these things are actually populating and closing in the duct, this becoming dense. The one here in the middle, this one was a rat experiment where they actually, the, they were again exposed during development and the rats at a young age, they develop uh, full blown tumors. But it's not just that, there are also studies that have been looking at the composition and the nutritional value of the milk of mice or rats that were exposed to bisphenol A during development. So there's a lot of work that has happened and that is just to briefly mention how important it is, uh, the developmental exposures and the long term consequences. So we, don't agencies usually don't don't ask for developmental exposure experiments. Um, now, when the mammary gland is looked at uh, in in a toxicity testing to figure out the risk of a chemical to humans or animals, um, they don't look at the mammary gland uh, in a way that it is um, adequate in my uh, in my uh, assessment. 
uh, they often miss important developmental changes. Uh, and why is that? Uh, this is what I call the leaf and the tree um, comparison. On the left-hand side here, you see how a mammary gland, a human breast, looks like in a very early age uh, girl. It looks really like a tree. Um, on the right-hand side is how uh, the tissue, the mammary gland, is processed and looked at at the microscope. You can't really see much of anything. You, you miss the patterns, you miss the topography, you miss how it is growing. You just have a very, very, very thin layer of tissue and it is, it's hard to figure out uh, where it is. And it, that is what I call the leaf. We are looking at the leaf and we are missing the whole tree. Um, this is uh, now on mice. These are the type of experiments that uh, are giving us a lot of information when we look at the trees. This is called a technique called hole mounted uh, because you put the whole organ on a glass and then you stain it and you can see it in three dimensions how they grow. And unfortunately, over here on the right hand side is the preferred method for studying mammary gland toxicity um, in regulatory toxicology guidelines. We are looking at the leaf. And why it's important, again, to look at the whole tree, because with a naked eye, you already can see differences. Here, this the pattern on top, this is, these are mice during puberty. The A is a mouse that was didn't get any bisphenol A. Uh, the B and the C, the mothers were given different concentrations of bisphenol A. So even those three are different. Very clearly, you can identify that these are different things. And on the bottom, similarly, but with an adult mammary gland where the effects persist over time. So this is a reliable measurement uh, or reli reliable at least screening diagnostic uh, method. And we are trying, working very hard to make it reliable uh, for the regulators. This is another example when you have this, uh, the whole mammary gland on a glass you can quickly identify anomalies. This is something uh, that we don't know what it is until we cut it out and we put it under the microscope. So this could be an inflammatory response. This could be the, the beginning of a tumor. It could be a cyst. But at least as, as soon as we have the whole mammary gland on a piece of glass, we already see that there is there could be a problem. So on the right hand side here, as you can see, these are blocks of paraffin that, that has pieces of tissue in it that is cut very thinly and this is how it looks like on, on, a, on a glass. And as you can see, you can identify any patterns of any kind as easily as you can do it with this technique. Um, as I said, there are a lot of very smart people trying to make sure that these measurements are reliable, are reproducible, and they are relevant to decide whether a chemical is affecting the mammary gland or not. So those are just uh, very interesting pictures from this group that is working, even develop, developing software to make it uh, automatic for, for anybody to use it. And just to point out, I've been mentioning and putting a lot of pictures of females like this one over here. This tiny one is a male mammary gland uh, from a mouse. So they do have uh, mammary glands. Uh, they just don't have the connection to the skin, to the nipple. So uh, there are many different ways that we can study the mammary gland. And the issue is, 
how do we, and, and we know it's a very sensitive organ to chemical exposures. So, so what do we do now to reduce exposures to those toxic chemicals? Where do we even start? Um, as I said earlier, the mammary gland response and, and, and the, the normal development um, is controlled by many different um, hormones. And there are all sorts of tissues also associated with them, like the fat tissue that also create its own um, molecules that are going to influence the, the, the development of the mammary gland. Or there are fibers, collagen fibers, that can make the breast more or less dense. But the, one of the main uh, issues to move forward and to be more protective of the mammary gland is uh, we need a very thorough update on chemical testing guidelines, not only to make sure that all the, the chemicals are tested and the mammary glands are included in the organs that are evaluated for toxicity, but we need to start mandating screening for chemicals that uh, for endocrine disrupting properties. Um, that is going to be for certain something that will affect the development of the mammary gland. And there are different ways that can be done. Um, it could be done in um, this very uh, sophisticated um, techniques where the mammary gland, uh, fetal mammary gland, is put on a dish and is uh, uh, grown on a dish. And an incubator in the laboratory can be exposed to different chemicals, individual chemicals, or um, mixtures of chemicals, and this could be a model to um, basically uh, identify which chemicals are uh, having a developmental um, effect in the, in, on the gland. Um, and it would be useful because, again, it could measure or it could test mixtures. That is something that we are not doing uh, at the time. This is another um, type of in vitro outside the animal type of uh, testing where human uh, mammary, um, human breast cells, um, the two different types can be grown together and sort of reproduce how the breast looks like. You have the ducts here, you have this round alveoli structures. And again, this could be potentially another system where we can test uh, individual chemicals or uh, mixtures of chemicals to see how they uh, they affect um, the mammary gland development uh, and biology. Now, uh, what is important again is to use this whole mount techniques to really figure things out. Um, stop. Um, non-stop using the histology, basically the one with this very thin um, cut uh, section of the of the organ, but complement it with this system where you can actually very quickly can identify problems and move on to do the uh, the microscopic assessment later on. Um, Another way is to reassess the safety of chemicals. Um, there are, um, what I just showed you before with the different techniques of how to test for chemicals, that would be useful for new chemicals that are trying to get into the marketplace. But we have thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals already in the marketplace that uh, for which we have no information on how they could affect the mammary gland or any other organs for that matter. When it comes to food, um, food additives, for instance, there is a huge data gap where we don't have information about uh, chemicals and how they, they actually, um, if they may affect an animal when we, uh, we feed them with that additive. Um, but for those that are in the, already in the marketplace, it's important that we use all the possible uh, tools that are available to prioritize which ones could be endocrine disruptors, which ones could be potential uh, carcinogens, 
and and uh, also use new predictive uh, technologies and, and tools to identify potential problems. So once we character we identified and prioritized which are those chemicals, we should definitely uh, ensure that they are tested for toxicity to the mammary gland. And these are just examples of of groups and, and tools that are available where now with information that is already available people can identify chemicals that are endocrine disruptors or carcinogens. Um, a lot of it is done with data that has been generated not using animals. That, that is another objective. We, we should try to use as fewer animals as possible. Um, when it comes to which chemicals, we have a bunch that are already known to be endocrine disruptors and to be toxic to the mammary gland. So this is just a, a short list that has been published. The bisphenols, some phthalates. Phthalates are usually used in cosmetics to, to transport like carriers for fragrances or in cleaning products. Um, and are also used as plasticizers to make plastics more flexible, softer, uh, and, and the usual bisphenol A and other um, um, re uh, related ke chemicals are also bisphenols. So we basically know a lot already. Um, we just need to make sure we are using our knowledge correctly and one of those is what uh, the group at um, uh, Silent Spring uh, have identified that in this case, um, when the Environmental Protection Agency was assessing and doing the risk assessment of pesticides, and they have seen tumors in the mammary gland that were caused by those pesticides in animal models, they, it wasn't clear how the agency was actually analyzing and assessing those um, mammary gland um, adverse effects. Um, not only on the issue of tumors, as they point out here, but for five pesticides that altered development, um, it wasn't clear that the implication for lactation and cancer risk were assessed at all. So uh, there's um, a lot that can be done and when we look forward what can we do i think as i mentioned earlier there is a, a renewed effort to reframe the conversation and again bring back the mammary gland to the forefront of many people including those uh, that make decisions that are going to affect our lives and this is a multi-pronged appro approach that needs to be uh, put into place. These are just a few ideas. Uh, the scientists continue to do uh, their efforts to basically standardize the assessment of the mammary gland using this, this method of whole mounts. Uh, the regulators want, like to have a measurement that can be done um, easily, that is reproducible, and it is reliable and they are far from being convinced that this method is, is useful. Uh, many laboratories and commercial, commercial laboratories that are contracted by um, companies to do their uh, toxicity testing, they don't even know how to collect the mammary gland and do those type of um, whole mounts. I personally was involved in um, with one of my clients to, to train uh, the, the veterinary technicians uh, in a commercial contract laboratory on how to remove the mammary glands, how to, uh, to uh, stain them, how to read the, the whole mounts and the like. And they were very gracious and open for me to go and, and, and do that with them. But uh, that is my own experience and I don't think this is happening uh, in many other places. Uh, the test guidelines, they need to, uh, we need to engage with the regulatory agencies and get them to understand that they need to incorporate this type of, um, of 
methods to basically routinely test for toxics to the mammary gland. Uh, policy <clears throat> is so necessary to go back to the policymakers um, and educate them. And um, they, they are the ones that they will put pressure on regulatory agencies to modernize their methods and their assessments and their guidelines, and also, more importantly, provide the resources to do that. And I think that for the fourth component is to continue working with communities, communities that are affected by um, chemical exposures, um, engage with them, uh, listen to their uh, needs, which kind of, of um, health concerns they have, and how we all can collaborate to educate the members of the community, and get the help they need, and put them in contact with those that are going to be making um, decisions. Um, so as a final uh, thought, um, just to come back to the issue of breast health, um, from the womb until we go to the tomb, the, the mammary gland, the breast, um, is uh, the health is a continuum. And um, I think uh, I can, I gave you enough information to um, figure out how you can help, but also how we can work together to prevent and reduce unnecessary exposures and unnecessary risks at every age. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much for the invitation and um, I will be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Matheny. That was quite interesting and definitely raise a lot of questions. And I believe part of your multi-pronged approach is uh, something the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition is uh, very interested in and perhaps is helping to play a role in, in one of those strategies here, if, if not more. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, first, I, I have a question. Uh, I definitely see a lot of breast cancer here. I, I diagnose it almost every day. Uh, has there been any research done into the particular types of breast cancer that are developing? Uh, viewer, viewers may know there's a couple of broad categories of cancer. There's, a duct, there's invasive ductal, there's invasive lobular, there's uh, DCIS, in situ cancers, and different ER, PR profiles. Do, do we know anything about that or is it still a bit too early? Uh, to really have a better handle on the, the signature of these types of breast cancers that are coming from environmental causes? I don't think there is a pattern, as far as I know, um, that has emerged. They are usually um, ductal um, carcinomas, um, but uh, I, I don't think there has, I don't remember seeing anything that was directly related to the type of pathology. Um, in some cases, or many cases, are estrogen receptor positive, um, but that is as far as my knowledge goes. Okay. <laughs> in, 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 the, in the animals, um, um, it's usually ductal carcinomas. Got it, thank you. Uh, we, we do have a few questions. One. Uh, we're, we're not exposed to single chemicals. Thus, how do we study or recognize the role of mixtures of chemicals and tease out what exactly is harmful, what isn't, and what's contributing to breast cancer or, or breast toxicity in general? Yeah, this that is a very uh, important question. Um, the the mixtures is really what we are exposed to, and we don't know the components of those mixtures, unfortunately. Um, but there are a lot of in vitro tests, tests that don't require the use of animals, that we can use to figure out, for instance, when you have um, uh, a bottle like this, uh, is it this, this plastic leaching something? that could be uh, toxic to the mammary gland. 
we can test now what leaches from this plastic into a dish that has breast cells. And that would give us at least a hint of whether or not there is something in this mixture that comes out from the material that would affect the breast cells. Uh, but fundamentally, there are laws that uh, are protective in the sense that you should be regulating chemicals as a class and not doing the, the risk assessment one chemical at a time, but assess them as a family of chemicals, as a family of chemicals in this case that would affect the mammary gland. So instead of having one safe dose, one safe uh, 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 amount that we are exposed to for let's say 15 different chemicals that affect the mammary gland, we should have one dose for the entire 15 of them. So in, in that case, we bring down the exposures and we continue. It's a more protective um, level of exposure. The, um, the laws around food chemicals, food additives, chemicals that come into food through packaging, is specifically written to do class chemicals assessment. Unfortunately, it's not the case. We continue to look at one chemical at a time and it's gonna take uh, forever and we are getting deeper and deeper into trouble. Great, thank you for that comprehensive answer. One other question that's come in here, uh, solutions to these ongoing exposures seem to be beyond individual decisions. And I, I know it, uh, it's something that you put the slide up on about the multi-pronged approach. So how, how can we influence changes? Um, that is something that I've been trying to figure out myself as well. Um, I, I think education is important. I think bringing to those in your community that have the power to make decisions over how things are done, bring to them the experiences from the communities that are affected by certain exposures is very important. Um, get them to meet people. And I know this is something that uh, MBCC has done for decades. Uh, bring affected people to talk to those that are going to be deciding over their futures or the future of their communities. But keep the pressure going. And as I said, as, as, as much as we can um, start reframing the conversation that this is about breast health. If we cannot, if women cannot a nurse, if women cannot, um, um, you know, um, it is it is beyond breast cancer in my opinion breast cancer is what everybody is concerned about but we get there because of things that happen early in our lives so get to uh, get people to understand that this is not a one one event that happened to somebody because it was unlucky this is something that is happening all the time to everybody because it starts when we are in the womb. Great, thank you for that answer. And, and it underscores the importance of the individual. Uh, one person can make a phone call and advocate for increased funding for these types of studies with their local or state federal legislator and uh, Absolutely. Make, make, make sure our voices are heard. Absolutely, yes, 100%. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Maffini. On behalf of myself, the MBCC Board of Directors, and Cheryl Osimo, the MBCC Executive Director, I want to thank, thank you for this very informative discussion today. And I want to thank all of our listeners who tuned in today to join us. For those interested, the recording of this webinar will be made available later today on the MBC website at mbcc.org. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.